Welcome to St. Mary's Harefield Stream Service for Sunday the 9th of October 2022, the 17th Sunday after Trinity. We begin with a hymn of praise, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. It was written by Sir Robert Grant. He was a lawyer by trade, born in India, and became a politician. He was knighted and appointed Governor of Bombay. And this hymn is a paraphrase of Psalm 104. It focuses on God's mercy and care for the created world and for the creation of ourselves as human beings. We we'll worship the King, all glorious above, or we'll gratefully sing his power and his love. Let us pray. Collect for today, the 17th Sunday after Trinity. Gracious God, you call us to fullness of life. Deliver us from unbelief and banish our anxieties with the liberating love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We also pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
If you'd like to get hold of a piece of bread, we're going to be sharing that later in the service uh, together. So if you want to get it ready, then please do so. The Old Testament reading today is from 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Naaman is healed of leprosy. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Nahum to you, so that he may be, you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh, your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he tells you, Wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored, and he became clean, like that of a young boy. Then Naaman, or all his attendants, went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Or did Naaman have leprosy? Maybe not. We didn't know the cause of leprosy until 1873 which is quite a few centuries after this story took place. In the biblical text, it's placed in the 9th century BC. At that time, a number of infectious skin diseases fell under the umbrella title of leprosy. This might have been one of them. In 1873, a Norwegian scientist named Hansen discovered that leprosy was caused by a bacterium, Mycobacterium leprae. So leprosy in the medical world is now called Hansen's disease. It was one thing to discover the cause, it was quite another to find a cure. The cure for leprosy, Hansen's disease, eventually came in the 1980s, after treatment using Dapsone had proved to be partially effective. So-called multi-drug therapy, MDT for short, combined three antibiotics, Dapsone, Clefazamine and Rifampazine, which proved to be effective against this particular bacterium. The Leprosy Mission was founded in 1874 by a young Irishman, Wellesley Bailey, who came across leprosy when he was working as a teacher in the Punjab in India. 
he came across a row of huts inhabited by men and women with serious disabilities and physical deformities. A colleague ex explained that they were suffering from leprosy, and Bailey was shocked by what he saw. Afterwards, he wrote, I almost shuddered, yet I was at the same time fascinated, and I felt that if ever there was a Christ-like work in the world, it was to go amongst these poor sufferers and bring them the consolation of the gospel. There was no cure for leprosy in these early days, of course, but there was care. Leprosy-affected people were loved and cared for. The book that tells the story of the leprosy mission is entitled Caring Comes First. There's a lot of misunderstanding about leprosy. People think it's disappeared, but it hasn't. It's still found in Southeast Asia, especially India, some parts of Africa and in South America. It's a nerve disease, not a skin disease, although the skin can be affected. The bacterium attacks the nerves in the body's peripheral nervous system near the surface, and people lose feeling in these nerves. Damage can be self-inflicted because people can't feel anything. One of the things that used to be done is to give people cats because the rats would nibble people's fingers and toes and they didn't feel, they, could, they couldn't tell. So cats kept the rat numbers down, which saves the damage from nibbling. Leprosy is also not contagious, it's only mildly infectious. It isn't caught through touch, it's passed on by droplet infection. I worked with the leprosy mission myself for seven years as the area coordinator, first of all for Wales and then for London. I travelled abroad to India, Nepal and Nigeria to develop projects which would help leprosy-affected people. And the people I met had all been cured through MDT, but they still had damage to their affected nerves. I met many people who had had operations on their clawed hands to open up the hand and get the fingers working again. I also came to realise just how important and how serious the stigma of having leprosy is, leading to the social isolation of those who suffer, despite the fact that they've been cured. Those with leprosy have been kept at arm's length. They've been forced to live in leprosy communities, to ring bells, to warn others, to keep their distance. Anyway, let's get back to the story in the Old Testament in the 9th century BC Israel. The main character in the story, Naaman, is not from Israel, he's an Aramean, the land of Aram being northeast of Israel, where Syria is today. Naaman doesn't seem to be socially isolated. What he suffers from might or might not be Hansen's disease, but he's certainly in need of healing. And two minor characters in this story open up the way for Naaman to be healed. Firstly, a girl captured during an Aramean raid on Israel and basically pressed into life as a slave. 2 Kings 5, 2 to 5. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. To cut a longer story short, Naaman gets to find the prophet in question, Elisha, but he isn't very impressed with what Elisha does and says. Verses 9 to 12. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. This could easily have been the end of the story, but it isn't because of another minor character or two. Verses 13 to 14. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he tells you, 
wash and be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Those bit part players enabled Naaman to find healing. Naaman should be extremely grateful to the young girl who knew that Elisha could make a difference. He should be extremely grateful too to his servants who confronted him in his rage when he refused to do a humbling thing that Elisha said to him. They suggested that he swallows his pride and washes seven times in the Jordan and Naaman was healed and his life was completely changed. If only Putin had such good advisers around him who could give him a different narrative, confront him in his rage, change his thinking and his approach. How many lives could be saved if Putin could humble himself, as Naaman did, and accept a different solution? Of course, he keeps people at arm's length. 2 Kings 5.15 Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in the world except in Israel. Sometimes we might be able to be the advisers that help others, or we might be those who need to heed the advice of others. Whichever is the case, let's be willing to accept opportunity, correction, and to take the pathway of humility which can open the door to healing. But in respect to those who have suffered from stigmatizing diseases, like leprosy or HIV AIDS, we now rejoice that they have a cure for their condition. But we'd also do well to remember the title of that book that tells the story of the leprosy mission, Caring Comes First. Caring is something we can all do in nearly every situation, and it always makes a difference. The hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, was written by George Matheson, a 19th century Scottish preacher, on the evening of his sister's marriage. Years before this, George Matheson had been engaged until his fiancée learned that he was going blind. There was nothing the doctors could do, and she told him that she could not go through life with a blind man. She left him. In his intense sadness, George Matheson wrote this hymn about a love that would never let him go. O oh, love that would not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee.
Today's Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. It's Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Jesus heals ten men with leprosy. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The focus in this story is not so much on leprosy, but on the outsider. Having something like leprosy makes a person an outsider, isolated and marginalised. Leprosy, which I mentioned something about earlier, used to be in this country. Some medieval churches had a leper's squint, where a person with leprosy could stand outside the church, but look in, but not come in, and see the service from outside. He might have been to Crete, to visit the island of Spinalonga, which contained a leprosy colony until the 1950s. A reminder that leprosy was in Europe until then. If you want to read something about Spinalonga, by the way, Victoria Hislop's book called The Island is highly recommended. But the point about lepers' squints and leprosy colonies emphasised just how much people affected by the disease become outsiders in the eyes of normal society. So in Luke's Gospel story, we come across a group of ten men with leprosy who keep their distance from Jesus, but who cry out to him in desperation. Luke chapter 17, verse 13. They called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And then verses 14 to 16. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was cleansed and healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Luke doesn't say that the nine who don't bother to return to Jesus to say thank you are less healed than the one who does return, but they're certainly less grateful. The one who does return, who praises God and thanks Jesus profusely, is a double outsider, as he's also a Samaritan, as well as somebody who had leprosy. The Samaritans are hated by the Jews. They lived in central Israel. There are still some there today. They have a different system of worship and belief. The ironic thing is that it's only the Samaritan who gives God the glory. He shows up the Jews whose very name reminds them to praise God. The word Judah, from which Jew is derived in Hebrew, means praise. So how are we doing on the thank you front, I wonder, ourselves? An attitude of gratitude can make such a difference The 13th to 14th century German mystic Meister Eckhart famously said, If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. But if the ratio holds true, that only one in ten people actually bother to be grateful, we've got a bit of a problem here with human nature. That's something we can all change. One thank you at a time. The hymn or song Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart was written in 1978 by the songwriter Henry Smith. He wrote 300 worship songs, but he only published this one. It was written after Smith had trouble finding work, after graduating from university. He was suffering from the degenerative condition that eventually left him almost blind. So in every situation we find ourselves in, it's possible and healthy to be thankful because God is the giver of life and the giver of new hope in the midst of challenge and the giver of Jesus, who freely gives his life as a ransom for many. Give thanks 
with a grateful heart. As we come to our time of prayer, I'm going to light a candle as we remember and pray for the people of Ukraine. Let us pray. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine in their counteroffensive, with the discovery of mass graves and the concern of Russia reprisals. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. We pray for the aftermath of the terrible shooting in Thailand, and especially for the parents whose children were killed. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. We pray for all affected in the petrol station explosion in Donegal in Ireland. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. We continue to pray for the tense situation in Iran, where brave demonstrations continue 
against a background of repression. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. We also pray for the worrying economic climate with rising costs and planned strike action. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. And so we pray for those who are ill. We especially remember Andrew Garner, baby Alexandra, Barbara Leek, Brenda Davis, Candy Hamler, who is now in hospital, Carlene, Catherine Anderson, Eunice Haswell, Gareth Williams, Jill Pepperell, Gregory Ash, Ian Smales, John Butler, Lewin, Mark, Neil, Neil Osgood, Pat Bubia, Pat Moore, Pauline, and any others we know. And we pray for those who grieve for Beryl Harold, Eileen Brinklow, Charles Doherty, Pamela Humphreys, Ivan Oliver, Paula Heath, and any others known to us. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The hymn Jesus, Lover of My Soul, was written by Charles Wesley in 1738, within months of his Christian conversion. It was first published in 1740 as a poem, and it wasn't paired to a hymn tune until seven years after Wesley's death. But now it's very popular and can be found in over 2,500 hymnals. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly.
So we're going to uh, share some bread together, and if you would like to go and fetch a piece, I'm just going to fetch mine. So it was a very symbolic thing to do, to share bread, to break bread. Bread being the basic staple thing about life. We all need some version of bread. And so as we break this bread, we remember that God is the author and giver of all good things. We thank him for so much. And as we thank God for each other too, we're going to hear a tune on the flute. St. Mary's Church is open to visit this week, uh, Monday, tomorrow from 10 till 2, Wednesday from 10 till 1, and on Saturday from 10 till 1. And tomorrow, Monday, is also a coffee morning at Harefield Library at 10.30am until 12 noon uh, to mark World Mental Health Day. So do come along if you'd like to. All are welcome to that. And tomorrow evening is the Tenants and Residents Association meeting at the Park Lane Village Centre. That's at 7.30pm. There is a midweek service, as usual, this Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the Church Hall Chapel. And on Wednesday evening, from 7.30 until 9.30, Hillingdon Deanery Synod is meeting at St. Matthew's Church, Usley. It's an open meeting, responding to the cost of living crisis in Hillingdon. It's a good and interesting topic, and all are welcome to go along if you'd like to. Next Sunday, services will be at the usual time at St. Mary's, 8 8 a.m. Communion and 10.30 a.m. Communion and also there'll be a streamed service again at 10.30. The hymn Will You Come and Follow Me was written by John Bell and Graham Moore of the Iona community from Scotland and first published in 1987. Back in the 6th century, St. Columba found his way from Ireland to Iona and established an outpost from which he evangelised all of Scotland. Eventually, he spread a Celtic form of Christianity that still resonates strongly today. And George MacLeod, a free church minister from Glasgow, established the Iona community in the 1930s to train ministers and to rebuild the abandoned Benedictine Abbey on the island. And John Bell, from Kilmarnock, south of Glasgow, joined the community in 1980. He's since become a challenging voice to minister to the marginalised, and in this hymn to leave oneself behind, to risk the hostile stare, to set the prisoner free, to kiss the leper clean, and use the faith we've found to reshape the world around. The tune is a Scottish ballad, Kelvin Grove. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name?
We end our service as usual with a poem. Edward Estling Cummings was an American poet, painter, author and playwright. He wrote almost 3,000 poems, one of which is entitled We Never Thank the Sun. But it's not really so much about the sun, but about friendship. We Never Thank the Sun, Edward Estling Cummings, 1894 to 1962. We never thank the sun enough for all it does for us, for all the light it shines around, for the warmth and the beauty and love. It just hangs there every day, a sparkle in the sky. We never stop to thank it, though, as it goes burning by. I think the friends are like the sun, in this way if no other. We relish their beauty and bask in their warmth, but never say so to one another. So I'm taking this chance to say, loud and proud and true, that I am so thankful that you're my friend, that I get to be a friend to you. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and love of God, 
and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and always. Amen. The hymn, Thou Whose Almighty Word, was written in 1816 by the Church of England minister John Marriott. He was a close friend of the Scottish author Sir Walter Scott. And we end our service with this hymn. Each of its verses ends with the words, Let there be light. It's a good desire and a good prayer as darker days develop at this time of year. Let there be light.